Hawkins Policy Radio, offering a unique perspective on everything, geopolitics, culture creation, the reality of the world we live in. Coming to you live from New York City, your host, Pierce Redmond. Okay, everybody, welcome back to another episode of Porkins Policy Radio. As always, I am your host, Pierce Redman, and you can find this show here at American Freedom Radio, AmericanFreedomRadio.com, as well as on my website, which is PorkinsPolicyReview.com. Uh, and you can always, uh, wa- listen to the show, excuse me, listen to the show, uh, on iTunes. We're now on TuneIn. Uh, on YouTube, you can also listen to it later on, on Friday nights. I'm replayed on a whole bunch of other, uh, internet radio stations. I'm also on Ed Opperman's iTunes and his Spreaker channel. So lots of ways to listen to the show. Uh, I know there was a few issues uh, over the weekend with, uh, the RSS feed. Uh, my RSS feed, it wasn't updating and people were sending me emails and things about that. Uh, the RSS feed for Porkins Policy Radio is all fine now. It's up to date. So, uh, again, if you want to listen on iTunes or tune in now, uh, definitely go there. Also, leave me a review if you can. And then uh, a, a quick, uh, you know, I don't mention it enough, but if you want to support the work that I do here, uh, I, of course, have a Patreon where you can sign up. But I also encourage you to support American Freedom Radio, both through their Patreon as well as on PayPal. If you just click the donate button uh, for American Freedom Radio on our on the website for AFR, you can become a recurring subscriber. And again, if you if you like the work that I do, you want to support me. A great way to do that is to support American Freedom Radio. So please go ahead and do that if you can. Uh, one other quick thing before we get to today's episode, the uh, bonus podcast uh, should be up. Uh, I'm, I'm aiming to get it up by like Thursday or Friday at the latest, but uh, it will be up. And uh, it was the first in a three part series on the British TV show House of Cards that Tom Secker and I are doing. So we uh, discussed the first series, which is also entitled a House of Cards. So uh, look out for that. Of course, uh, I will uh, let you all know when that is posted up. But today um, we have uh, we are joined once again by a good friend of the show and a frequent guest, Pat McKenna. Of course, Pat is a private investigator who has worked on numerous cases, uh, tons and tons of high profile cases. And of course. The uh, the one of the most high profile is the O.J. Simpson case, and that is uh, why we have asked Pat to join us again. We're going to get into a whole bunch of stuff. But uh, Pat, how are you? I'm good. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Excellent. Well, um, Pat, uh, before we kind of get into today's uh, topics, I just you know, just to just to mention you live down in Florida uh, Florida and the, the Caribbean, uh, Puerto Rico in particular, have just been through a series of brutal storms. You had no power uh, a few weeks ago. We were, we were supposed to record, I think, back on the 12th, uh, and we couldn't yeah. do it because of, uh, you know, you were you were telling me, you were very sweet, Pat. You were saying, uh, oh, well, maybe I'll try and plug my phone into my car, and, and I told you, you know, we could just wait, but... Um, how are you doing? How how is everything down uh, where you are? Uh, is is Mar-a-Lago still standing, Pat? Yeah, unfortunately, it, <laughs> it's still there. <laughs> but we did all right, you know. Just uh, I think I was out of power eight days, a lot of landscape damage. You know, first world problems that don't bother me all that much mm, compared mm. to people in Puerto Rico and and some of those islands that got just hammered. So. I basically want to go on the car, not so much to do the show, but to have some air conditioning. Oh. <laughs> uh, no, I'm kidding. Uh, so, yeah, it was, we were out power for a few days, and, uh, yeah. you know, you throw away all your food and stuff like that. But, mm-hmm. you know, that's, like I say, first world problems. The grocery stores open back up, and you can get back up and running. And it's just clean up now, and I know how to clean up. So you just right. clean. You know, mm. drag, no, drag the stuff to the street. No. It, it's funny that was the um you know I'm 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 in New York and Hurricane Sandy obviously swept through here yeah. and my general experience of it was 
um, like you said, you know, first world problems, like our, our internet went yeah. out. Um, so yeah. me and my sister were, were really pissed about that, you know. So we, we, yeah. we instead we had to, we were forced to read comic books and watch, uh, DVDs all night, you know, and that was like our big inconvenience. And of course, I mean, yeah. um, you know, my, my aunt and uncle, they, their house was destroyed in Sandy. My uncle's car was, uh, swept Jeez. up yeah. off into the, the ocean. Um, although yeah. that was partly his fault because he parked it right next to the beach, uh, for whatever yeah. reason. <laughs> but, yeah. uh, yes, yeah, certainly the, the first world problem. But, yeah. Um, so we're all good. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, uh, Pat, I've, I've asked you to, uh, come back on the show again. You, uh, I, I gotta tell you, the listeners, uh, always love having you on. Our episodes together are very popular people. Um, you know, seemingly can't get enough of the, the OJ. So I know, I know some of, some listeners are, are fans out there. I don't know if they're really truly listeners. Um, they do complain, right. uh, about, uh, you know, oh, we got it. OJ's innocent, whatever. But there's always right. so much more to kind of explore with this case. And I did want to get sure. you on because, um, after serving nine years in prison for armed robbery in Las Vegas, OJ is now uh, going to be leaving. Lovelock Prison in Nevada, uh, in yep. sometime in early October, I believe, uh, very soon. Uh, he was granted parole yep. on July 21st. And, uh, you know, this is a, this is a fairly big deal. Um, OJ was looking at oh. something like, what was it, 30 years in prison? I think 35, maybe. I, I'm not yeah. certain, but he, he, frankly, still looks at that, uh, getting out on parole. And I had mentioned to him, you still have one foot in the Nevada Department of Corrections until mm. parole is over. So if you, uh, if you're like redeeming a coupon for a loaf of bread at the store, make sure the coupon didn't expire yesterday or you'll probably be mm-hmm. violated for attempted coupon fraud or something. So, right. uh, it won't be easy, obviously, but, uh, but mm. he, he can handle it. He, I'm sure it's easier to handle than nine years in, in prison for, uh, don't forget kidnapping. He was charged with kidnapping too. You know when That's he right. said nobody yes. was so kidnapping. Yeah. Um, so I'm assuming he'll do fine. I get first thing, Pat. Um, I, yeah. I'm of the opinion this was this was definitely the right decision by the parole board. His sentence was um, what well, you know you, you mentioned there: armed robbery and kidnapping, which sounds quite right. serious. But if you Sounds read more? the yeah. actual. Criminal complaints, if you actually go through what, you know, was presented in court, it's not, you know, it, it, it's like the most sort of benign form of armed robbery. Um, you know, of course, OJ was not armed. Uh, there was one other guy who he didn't know all that well that was armed. They weren't really robbing this uh, individual. This was a friend right. of OJ's who had acquired uh, a lot of this memorabilia and had actually contacted Simpson to, you know, to mm-hmm. offer to, to give it back to him. So, I mean, do you think this was the right decision by the parole board? I know that, uh, the knee jerk reaction is, of course, uh, oh, you know, there he goes. He gets, <laughs> he gets away with it again. Right, right. Well, I think it was the right decision because he had an impeccable, spotless prison record, which is, generally unusual for almost every inmate because sooner or later you're going to get a DR, which is a disciplinary report or a write-up for whatever your bed's not made or whatever. They can do anything right. uh, to kind of jam you up. His his record was impeccable. It was even above and beyond. I think they used him to kind of uh, be the voice of reason when groups of inmates would have a disagreement and he'd kind of mediate it and stuff like that. And uh, I mean, uh, he did, Samir Gravano murdered 21 people in cold blood for John Gotti and got five years, okay? <laughs> so, uh, and then he comes out after five years and runs an ecstasy ring, and I think he did 21 years, still less than what they want O.J. Simpson to do. So I think the parole commission was, you know, absolutely correct i mean they had no there was no way not to give him parole except unless you were you know dishonest and you said well i i think the seriousness of the crime warrants you spend the come back in three years or you know that kind of mm-hmm. stuff uh so i think they did the right thing and he'll he'll do fine when he gets out mm. 
and so. you know, I, I don't want to get too too bogged down in, in some of the details, but there is yeah. also quite a lot of, of Im- misinformation regarding this case. Uh, so you oh know, I, I definitely encourage people to you know w- watch the parole hearing itself. You know, you can just watch sure. the parole hearing sure. and you can see yeah. you know what OJ presents what was presented in the courts, you know, you yep. can uh, go find the transcripts. I believe a lot of the, um, you know, uh, the court proceedings were filmed in Nevada. You know, they were on TV. Yeah. So, you know, you can, yeah. you can find them. Uh, and I, I would definitely encourage people to, to check it out because the, the image that is, and this is sort of, you know, a, a transition into some of the stuff I want to talk to you, but the, the media, the media okay. has unsurprisingly, gone into freak out mode over both yeah. the parole birds decision. Uh, and we've seen yeah. this like whole series of articles. Some of them are old. Some of them are new. Uh, not only villainizing uh, OJ, but, uh, you know, making the, the, this armed robbery kidnapping charge sound a lot more nefarious than it really was. You know, I just sure. saw uh, people, on Twitter and, and things like that, you know, retweeting uh, stories that, you know, Jill Shively, uh, a known liar, um, you, know, he, you know, yeah, well, yeah. Yeah, and there, there, the, this bullshit stuff with Shively, how she's afraid, you know, because OJ is going to get released and, um, you know, he's going to, I don't know, snap and come and kill her, uh, you know, and again, yeah. there's a woman that didn't even testify during the trial. She's a known liar and a con artist. Um, but yeah. people in the media in particular love recycling those sort of stories. And I wanted to get your take on a few things that I saw that came out uh, most recently related to this. One, we've got this uh, documentary on A&E, which I haven't had a chance to see yet. Um, that was It's called OJ, Guilty in Vegas. And this to me seems pretty unusual um, for – even for a oh. high-profile – individual like OJ to get parole and then to instantly have a a huge TV channel put out a documentary talking about how you're guilty and how you're, I mean, what do you make of that alone, Pat? I mean, that is unusual, is it not? Well, yeah, but here's kind of my observation when it comes to the media, because I saw it with my own eyes right before me for well over a year out there is I think that the corporate world in the media saw what kind of money this thing generated way back when, more than any of this other stuff. John Bonet, Casey, any mm-hmm. OJ since is a revenue stream. I don't care what kind of show you put on uh against him or uh, uh trashing him, you're gonna make money. And mm-hmm. so but frankly my phone's been blowing up since right before the poll hearing from all these people at these networks wanna you know, interview you and all that stuff, which I'm, I don't do. I come on your show because it's kind of fair, but these, and it's live, so you mm. can trap me, whatever you want to do, but these, <laughs> the, the ones that I have sat down for, uh, one of the worst was NBC, the 20 year anniversary. I said, you know, I know people at NBC in New York and all that. I said, well, you can come, come out here to my place for coming from California. I said, I'll open up. I have all my files. I'll let you look at anything. You can ask me any question, any, about anything. And, you know, he spent two or three days here, and any questions you have, I answer, point to a box. Well, here, look at this. Oh, you want to talk about the stock? Here, look at this. Uh, or whatever it was. And, you know, something when he got ready to leave, nice fella, uh, you know, let's go to dinner. Uh, we'll buy you dinner, blah, blah, blah. You've been very helpful mm. and cooperative and blah, blah, blah. So we go to a nice dinner. And as we're leaving the restaurant that night, he's going to catch a plane and all that. And, you know, we exchange information about our families, what our kids do, all that stuff. So he come on kind of like friendly. He said, you know, I just, did you know that Dan, Dan Patrick Shelley told us about two witnesses that were never called, Jill Shively and Skip Junis? And I said, you got to be kidding me. Do you <laughs> fact check anything? Do you guys, are you guys going to use that shit or are you going to fact check them? I said, Skip Junis's story is that he saw O.J. throwing stuff in a garbage can at the airport at LAX. I said, do you realize that there's in Discovery the video of O.J. Simpson walking through the air? He doesn't even look at a garbage can, okay? Mm-hmm. And, and and Jill Shively, for God's sakes, I don't even want to talk about that lunatic. And and yet she's just on this last week or something. They had a big thing. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. I think um, Brian alerted me to it. Uh, Brian Heist, who you guys yeah. know well. Uh 
uh, Doctor uh, Oz or some. Yeah, 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 exactly. So, <laughs> so I look at I look at that. I see they put a big stupid thing with her. They got big screens. Oh, here's the intersection. Here's this and that. It's kind of like you know, Doctor Oz. Ozzy Osbourne could have done a better show than you're doing right now if you even checked out Jill Shively and forget what a liar she is. Just her story, okay? This near auto accident at San Vicente and Bundy with this other car, et cetera, et cetera. And people, I remember, I got a report somewhere where she said there were people on the corners and he was screaming about, where are all those people? Where is someone that got in a near accident at 11 o'clock at night, uh, you know, on at that location, eight bazillion people came came to into this case. Oh, I was here, I was there, I saw this, I saw that. You know, 80% of them kooks, like Shively. But just examine her story. I mean, the story is he got up on the sidewalk, almost hit people. There's a bit screaming at the other driver and poor Jill standing on the corner where maybe she was in her car. It, where are, where are these other people? You know, it's like every story in there. And I hate to always go back to Tom Lang, but Tom Lang's the last person we know of that saw, not Tom Lang, the cop, Tom Lang, the witness, that saw yes. Nicole alive at 10 o'clock and sees these people. I remember talking to Lee Bailey. He's, uh, we're going over. And I said, Lee, these can't be friends. They, they have to be the people. If OJ didn't do it, who did it? It's got to be these people. If they were friendly, they would have come forward said, oh, I was at Nicole's house at 10 o'clock. And she was, I mean, at, yeah, at 10 o'clock. And, and she was out in the street with me. And, we, you know, we were at my truck. And my buddy was the guy standing in an angry stance. <laughs> Pardon, me. <clears throat> Pardon me. Just And so... <clears throat> Who are those people? They never came forward. Now, those people never came forward because I think they're the people, if O.J. didn't do it, those are the people that are involved because mm-hmm. they would have come forward. And the stories that that uh, Shively tell, the same thing. Well, where are those people? Where, where's this near accident? Mm-hmm. And the guy with the garbage cans, I mean, for God's sake, she got a video showing he didn't go near a garbage can. We had reports from the... the uh, it was a female that was the, uh, whatever she would be, the captain of the airport, for example, of LAX, the, the sheriff's office or LAPD, I forget which one it was, is kind of in charge of the security of the airport, right? So they have a whole division of airport people. They do everything. I remember mean, talking to her. She says, let me tell you something. Those garbage cans get looked through by everybody that empties them, okay? Because back in those days, people might throw out a plane ticket, for example, by mistake. You could mm-hmm. convert it to cash. Nowadays, you can't do that, of course. But, you know, I said people lose wristwatches and valuables and yeah, rings. Drugs. People are in a hurry. Yeah, drugs, marijuana, whatever. People mm-hmm. are in a hurry. And so the people that examine these garbage cans take a pretty good look. And we never heard anything like that. You'd think someone would come forward with bloody clothes or knives or whatever this allegation by Junis is. They even, I believe, went to the dump where all the trash goes to, you know, from the airport, for example, and kind of look through that. There was never any stupid weapons or anything like that. But the, but the, um, in an effort to, to damage Simpson at every, at every turn, people will buy into stuff like that. Now, all of a sudden this guy becomes, who knew about him in the case? Why didn't the state call him? Why didn't Marsha Clark call him as a witness? If she, you know why? Because she at least knew that we'd probably jam that video up her ass. <laughs> um, OJ walking all the way to the to the gate without ever even looking at a garbage can. He's on film from the moment he gets out of the limo signing autographs uh, all the way to he gets on the plane. Mm. So of course she didn't call him. Uh, she didn't call Jill Shively. It's got nothing to do with Jill Shively getting five grand from the National Enquirer. Jill Shively had been a con job out there, and a prosecutor happened to be walking by the grand jury room and spotted her in there for one of his cases where she uh, damned an actor. I forget the guy's name. One of the, you know, kind of a... Yes, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Soap opera. Famous uh, soap opera guy, yeah. And scammed him out of six. And they probably, and they probably said something like, Marshall, what do you got What do you got her in here for? Well, bop, 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 bop. She says this, 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 this. He probably had to sit down, Marshall. This woman is a lunatic. Don't call her. And then, mm-hmm. fortunately for them, she sold the story... Otherwise, they would have probably called her, and we would have mm-hmm. destroyed that woman. Yeah, we would have destroyed that crazy woman. But mm. it's just any chance you get, like you say, A&E. A&E is 
going to do this big stupid show uh, to, to show OJ's guilty of robbery and kidnapping or something. You know, and they'll they'll interview all the other people that were out there. That and the only way to get on these shows is to trash OJ Simpson. You know, and that's yeah. that's who gets interviewed. And all the thirty thirties and all that garbage. The OJ story by Jeff Tube and all that stuff. Uh, you know, if anybody like what you're doing, like what Brian does, we go through this stuff and you say, well, you know, I still have fights. I either have fights or I get invited back to parties. Like, I want to sit next to McKenna next year at Christmas. That guy was really, <laughs> I always thought system was guilty. Jeez, he mm. shot down everything. Mm. So, um, and none of us that want to say anything positive, we can't even, Lee and I have been writing on a book, working on a book. Uh, well, hell, we could write that over in two days, but no one will buy it. No, no one in the yeah. industry will put it out. You know, no one, nothing positive that, that we put together. We put together kind of like Brian's factual stuff mm. and they examine other craziness, uh, like their timeline, you know, the plaintiff whale of a dog still goes up my ass every time I hear it. I'd be, oh my God. Yeah. That's the time. Plaintiff whale mm. of a dog. It's like Casey Anthony threw a baby in the swamp. Oh my God. She threw a baby in the yes, swamp. Yes. Yeah. 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 Just like these yeah. little statements that get put out that are complete bullshit, okay? And and uh, so we just go through everything. We were laughing the other day, Brian and I were talking about the Chicago and this supposed uh, guy that saw OJ in Chicago burying something. And I went through everything because I was in Chicago when this guy came forward. I happened to be staying at the hotel. I was still out there. I went on June 16th, I think I was in Chicago and you know, stayed in the hotel. I didn't really get to interview anybody until that following Monday because of all the, the the law firms and everybody getting involved in the middle. I couldn't talk to anybody from the hotel unless the corporate lawyers heard. Couldn't talk to Hertz people until corporate okayed it. Couldn't talk to American Airlines until corporate in Dallas okayed it. So I basically spent a few days watching all the nonsense happening at this hotel. And, uh, I mean, if you want to get into that later, we can get into that. But it's just, the stuff that that was out there, if you look at everything, which who's got time to do all that? But these little vignettes of things like the Chicago thing are so laughable, but the stuff that got put out by the media, mm. you know, and, and like I say, the race was on for the most uh, eyeballs and, and clicks or whatever. They didn't even have eye click, eyeball clicks or whatever that computer. <laughs> yes. But it was ratings, you know, and, and, and yeah. For example, in Chicago, there here's these guys on TV, ABC, right? Big time ABC. We have confirmed, or we have learned from uh, law enforcement sources, right? You don't name them, but law enforcement sources believe that the weapon was a military style entrenching tool. They now believe that that's the murder weapon. Okay. Now that was, I don't know, a couple of weeks after, right? And you put that up with, oh, then there was the knives from Ross Cutlery, which we produced the one that O.J. bought. But, of course, they hear he bought a knife, so they're all down there like red hot, no shit, detectives bringing in loads of knives to say one of these must have been a weapon. Uh, so you got a guy that he just goes through this stuff. So so your theory is a guy puts on, a guy known all over the world, puts a stupid knit cap on, uh, gloves that don't fit him, uh, some crazy ass shoes that he's never had, uh, and then goes over. And, oh, and he has, don't forget, he has a shovel and a plastic bag in the back of his car. That was big in the preliminary hearing. Like yeah, that yeah. was all this. Uh, like one really does, you know. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah. So what, so your theory then, Marsh, is that he went over there looking like that to kill his wife. And then I guess he was going to bury her with the shovel in the bag and no one would ever ask a question, right? I mean, how absurd and asinine is that theory. And it just got more absurd and more asinine as we went through. But the media at night would talk about what happened in court that day, and it would be just total bullshit, not not even close to what happened. Or they would put a different spin on it, anything that was good for OJ. I mean, we'd come back and go, well, that was a good day. You know, when we put on our case over two days, even, I want to say, Stan Goldman, one of the, um, uh, you know, talking pundits, he's a professor, I think, of law out there at Loyola or somewhere, he come up to me and says, oh, my God, that was the best array of witnesses I've ever seen in a trial. I want to say, Stan, you're a law professor. What trials have you sat through? Um, <laughs> I appreciate the, comp the compliment, right? But, frankly, they're the, they were a, an array of witnesses that can pretty much dispel everything about the government's case. 
the timeline, the everything, right? So um, the cut on the finger, and I think I don't know if we went through all that already. I, I guess we did, but yeah, but, yeah, uh, yeah. You know, it's just. And people didn't, you never hear about that. People don't ever ask me. If I say, who's Wayne Stansfield? People look, I don't know. I go, well, he testified in the trial. Well, I don't remember. I said he was the pilot that flew the plane that came out and sat with OJ and, and uh, got his autograph in his flight log book. Or you say, what about, uh, you know, Howard, the kids from Hertz, okay? Oh, OJ hid everything in the uh, golf bag or else in the plane. He even took that. They even took the toilet apart on the plane. The plane landed in Chicago, went on to Albany. But I remember in Discovery getting, you know, those you know, those pictures of it when it's all exploded out like you do when you're trying to put your kid's toy together on Christmas. Mm-hmm. And, it's, you know, all those parts laid out. And you go, oh, Jesus. They even took the toilet apart to see if the, the weapons think that through. So O.J. Simpson gets all the way into the airport with a murder weapon so that he could put it in a toilet in the airplane. Yeah. I mean, my God, the logic in some of this stuff is it, it defies logic that they would even come up with this. Or, you know, I guess they have to investigate every lead. But, um, I mean, really, I mean, if I get assigned to go take the toilet apart, I would be thinking, why? Oh, there's a weapon in there? And then you go, Jesus, God, this guy kills two people, gets rid of everything, and and saves, a, saves something to stick in the toilet on an airplane. Doesn't throw it out the window of the limo or something. No, he brings it on an airplane. And some of the stuff, he would have to bring it into Chicago, bring it to his room, and then bring it back out to a crime scene. I mean, come on. Yeah. It's just it's no no logic. But you, can, I can't, this is like trying to talk to someone that says Donald Trump is not a misogynist or a racist. You, can't <laughs> right. just, you, cannot, you just cannot change some of those people's minds, no matter what. I mean, mm. I, I've had, you know, close friends well, just well, deny it no you know and and, and that's something I, i've found uh e- e- even stranger uh in, in the past couple of like weeks and months you know it, leading up to the yeah. parole hearings there's, there's been more yeah. of these the, these sort of um i mean they're they're actually stories based on nothing and they appear to nothing. be uh coming from the goldman's like pr machine but you know, we've, oh, yeah, we've, get, there's like yeah. a, a this story that TMZ, of course, has been pushing that um, uh, you know, and that with these these very leading uh, headlines, like where they're essentially suggesting that Jason and Sidney Simpson are who have been buying up real estate uh, in St. Petersburg, Florida, nothing fancy, run of the mill, you know, low income apartments, things like that. Right. And, right. you know, the the story that TMZ kind of pushes is that, oh, yeah. well, uh, this is coming from O.J.'s money and it, he's funneling it to them. And this is all yeah. because the Goldman's lawyers simply want to know where the money is coming from. They don't know, right. as, you know, as if Sidney and Jason can't raise their own capital to you right. know invest in real estate. You know, they're of course, again, right. it's just like. You know, they're, they're too stupid or they're too whatever. Sure. You know, they, they, they have to live off of their father. Um, yeah. And, you know, and then that story, and I've gotten this repeated to me from other people, and they're like, oh, oh look yeah. at this. You know, and it's yeah. like, but there's oh. actually nothing here. This is the Goldman's right. lawyer blowing right. smoke up TMZ's ass uh, and, yeah. and just sort of suggesting, oh, well, maybe, it, maybe it's coming from him, you know? But then yeah. suddenly – Jason and Sydney are, and without ever mentioning that, you know, the Goldman's foundation had their tax yeah. exempt status revoked because it was a scam. Yeah. Right. And how about this? How about that? How about the goddamn gall of the Goldman's and their lawyers to attempt to bully the two children of a woman that was murdered along with one of her friends from a restaurant? Okay. Yeah. We know since I, at least I'm certain in my mind that Simpson did not flash and murder two people in 20 minutes and get rid of everything. But the audacity, just not audacity, just shame to go after these children who have stayed out of the spotlight, have lived their lives uh, as, as good as you could, you know, expect from some, some orphans, yeah. basically. Uh, and then you go after them with no evidence, just the same old bullshit that you've been throwing on the screen every time Michael Wright and his publicity team can get a story out there uh that's what you do if these lawyers were so good they brag about how good they were in a civil case they did all this 
and now you still don't know where anything is, and you're going to say that the yeah. children <laughs> are are uh, buying a uh, you know thirty and forty thousand dollar home in yeah, it, it's in, nothing uh, even Florida. that crazy. Right? No, no, no. It's not like it, they've got some you know mansion or something or something big. They've got some little bit of properties. I mean, geez, sorry, they got some real estate experience. They want to make a living and, uh, you know, and stay out of the spotlight. So anyways. No, I know. But and again, it, it, it's the, the way that these stories, you know, the same thing. There was some uh, New York Post article saying that uh, Tom Scotto, who's a very close friend of OJ, that he's writing a book where he alleges that OJ's kids won't speak to him. And again, just a cursory glance at the, right. the closeness between the two of them, even if it was true, Scotto would never yeah. write something so mean and damaging to his right. best friend, who was, I believe, wasn't yeah. he, he was, that when he got busted in Vegas, he was at his wedding. That's, yeah, I met Tom Scotto in Florida. I heard about this wedding thing come up. Uh, we're at a restaurant here in Jupiter. We were at Ruth Chris Steakhouse and we went to a, a little restaurant in Jupiter, uh, nightclub thing. And quite frankly, I don't know if I ever spoke to him since then. I just said to, uh, somebody, friend of mine or Lee or somebody, I said, this guy's like right out of central casting. Who is this guy? Tom <laughs> Scott on why he's so far up OJ's ass. Well, it's obvious he's paying for dinner and everything like that. So I figured it out real quick. Um, and, but, before the hearing, this guy's being quoted as OJ's best friend, and we can't wait to get on a golf course and all this sort of stuff. Yeah, and and that was just, you know, made up shit. And and you're right, that was the wedding. I remember saying, OJ, oh, I'll I'll take care of this. Let me get a lawyer in Vegas and blah 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 blah. Uh, I didn't want to stay in front of this couple that supposedly are his new best friends, and they're having mm. renewing their vows, their <laughs> 25th anniversary vows. But I looked into the the, the uh, the world of, uh, what do you call that stuff? What was he going to? A, a, a memorabilia show. So I look into that world, right. and it's kind of like, it's probably like the art world, you know? Mm. I, I wouldn't believe anything is a real Rembrandt or this or that without thinking. So you have this three or four tiers of memorabilia, the really good shows where maybe Pete Rose is sitting there signing an autograph in front of you for five right. bucks or hot shows, or this is the, you know, uh, Peyton Manning saying, this is the jersey I won in the Super Bowl. I'm auctioning mm. it off for charity, whatever. Then you got the second, third tier, and that's where these guys were, way out on that periphery of Vegas, I think. Uh, not a big show, not a big, you know. It's like going to the uh, Longwood Gardens for, for a uh, flower show in Pennsylvania, and then <laughs> there's a guy standing on the corner selling shit that he's growing in his backyard. Hey, here, here's the try this. <laughs> There's a fern, you know, it's kind of like that. Yeah, yeah. So I'm thinking, why are you even going out there? And uh, um, and I remember when he got in trouble and he called me, I happened to be, my mom had just passed away and I was in, uh, uh, in uh, back in Chicago at my brother's house. And uh, what we were talking about, is he said, <laughs> I remember him saying, I think I need your help again. I said, dude, you got to go. I need some money. This time I can't do another case out of town for <laughs> short months. But, you know, it's kind of like, you did the same thing in terms of your cooperation with law enforcement that you did in your other case. So you go and you go right downtown to the Vegas police and you fully cooperate. And the guy supposedly got a gun is at the airport leaving town. So, you know, two, two prongs of bail are a risk of flight, a danger to the community. And I would suggest that a guy that's at an airport leaving town with a gun doesn't meet either test. He is a risk of flight and he is a danger. This guy gets down and, like OJ called it, gets a get out of jail card right away. All these guys get him, except for the guy that stood stood trial with him. And you know, he's, all he did, you look at his statements, uh, he's explaining exactly what happened. And uh, but they can twist little things and turn it into armed robbery and kidnapping. Nobody leaves till I get my stuff. Oh, that's the kidnapping charge. Those those words were what convicted him of kidnapping. So. Uh, no, I know, and, and you know, you, you, uh, I'm sure you saw this, Pat. I mean, it, you know, it's a, a fairly big deal all over the country, but definitely here in New York. You know, Anthony mm -hmm. Weiner just gets uh, convicted of. I think he, yeah. for, he's going to serve 21 months in prison, and uh, right. you know, the the and 
the the way that's phrased, you know, it's oh well, he was sexting with a fifteen year old. Yeah. You know, no, no, yeah. no, he was coercing a fifteen year old girl into getting naked, right. okay, and yeah. masturbating on camera right. for him. He's yeah. not sexting, you know, you know, dick pics right. or dirty messages. You know, I mean, right. there's, there's quite a bit of difference. Uh, uh, but again, you know, the but that's how that's interpreted, you know. Um, whereas OJ says, you know, like the one, th- you know, no one's leaving until I get my stuff. Oh, we're kidnapping this individual in his own hotel room. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's not like they, right. you know, I, yeah. I don't even know how you how you can kidnap somebody if you don't even leave their place. You know, yeah. it's, <laughs> um, it's mad. It's but, you know, mad thing. Uh, yeah, it's just it's maddening when you hear what people have to say and they they you know they view it as factual. It's just mm. insane, and um, it's just geez, it's such a a big uh, leap. How could we possibly accuse the white supremacists of planting a piece of evidence? You know, mm. and who then? By the way, I always I might have said this on your show. I don't know. I'm always babbling on about the insanity of this case. But Mark Furman is still being taped by that woman, Laura Hart McKinney, in July of '94, talking about without the. I'm the case. They call yeah. me Bloody Glove Furman. You know, without the glove, the case goes bye bye. Well, how does mm. he know that in July? What about August? They might have found a van with the bloody gloves and the knives and whatever. Uh, w- w- what about that? What if they found something else? What if they found who really did this or someone gave them? They would have looked the other way. But how does Mark Furman know in July, less than a month later, that he's, he's you know, he's in He's the key. He's the key to the case. whole case. He, he cannot be taken out of the case. He know, mm-hmm. He's a smart guy. I'll tell you that. Furman was pretty cunning in what he, <laughs> what he did and the way he did it. And mm-hmm. even more cunning, the way he's gotten away with everything for all these years. And thought of as kind of a hero to the cops out there that that uh, that you know. Well, you know, uh, Matt, that, that brings me to um, I wanted to get into some. Uh, we we got some listener questions from the last time we talked, oh, okay. and uh, yeah. this, this so th- these uh, come from uh, listener Simon out in the UK. Um, and these, these were um, actually one of them is a question I think we'll probably get to in the second hour more. But he had some some okay. uh, things he wanted us to address. Uh, the two things that Marsha Clark mentioned in the uh, O.J. Made in America documentary series. And um, okay. you know, you're just bringing up Mark Furman and, and the gloves and stuff. So we'll, we'll take that one first. But, uh, okay. you know, Marsha Clark, uh, one point in the documentary states uh, and this isn't the exact quote, I don't have it in front of me, but something to the effect of, well, Furman couldn't have framed O.J. because he couldn't have known O.J. wouldn't have a, wouldn't have an alibi. And this is something that I, I get quite a bit as well. Uh, and, you know, just off the, on the face of it, before I throw it to you, I just want to say that this presupposes that Furman actually gave a shit about stuff like that. You know, about, exactly. like, the, you know, th- this is like as if he could care – and I just – the thing I always point to when people bring this up is that not only did Furman frame guys all the time, you know, and, he, and bragged yeah. about it to McKinney. Right. But right. during the OJ trial, the LAPD settled with a man called Joseph Britton who Furman had shot, yep. planted a knife yep. on, and said, die, N-word, die. Okay, and that guy yeah. got $100,000. So he framed him. Yep. I mean, that man had no – you know, there was – Right. You know, forget this out, but uh, Pat, I'm going to throw it to you because I, I get this quite sure. a bit. Uh, and, you yeah. know, I just want to get your take on it. Sure. About the alibi, whether he knew he had an alibi. Yeah, exactly. And and, and the, the, okay. this is, you know, this is and again, too, this is also Marsha Clark trying to defend the fact that she knew Furman, you know, had framed people and that he was a dirty sure. cop. But, you know, yeah, sure. it, it, you know, just to address th- this issue that Furman couldn't have framed him because he wouldn't know that he wouldn't have an alibi. Right. Well, just, I mean, all you got to do is listen to all those tapes and you know what he thinks about uh, interracial couples, number one, so he could give a shit about their alibi. Number two, <laughs> where, I, my theory, he, I think he put the glove in the Bronco, okay? And if you look at Lang's book, they found that the, the little light that goes in the ceiling, what do you call that light? You know, the when your door opens up, yes, the bulb yeah, goes yeah, up. Light, yeah. That's a seat. So who took that out? You think O.J. Simpson, before he left for Chicago, took the light bulb out of the ceiling of the Bronco? 
So I think he put it there. And you know what? If he found out later that O.J. Simpson's been gone for six weeks, he could have taken it back out of the Bronco and gotten rid of it somewhere else. So I don't think he cared. I'm telling you, it's a very cunning guy that spent a career honing his craft of framing black people. Okay? So uh, he didn't give a shit about whether O.J.'s got an alibi or not. He, In his mind, he had his man. He was going to get the guy. And uh, even if the guy had an alibi, that's in his Bronco, you know? So mm. he could have taken it out of there. And 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 that's what he would have done as he as he got involved. I think between one and four, when he's running back and forth up there, because that's who Rosa Lopez hears, uh, walking up and down her driveway, um, they don't see anything in the house. So therefore, he probably says, "Well, Simpson ain't here, so let me go stick it in the Bronco." Mm. You know. And then when he talks to Cato, voila, he heads back, and where do we find the glove under the air conditioner? Mm. Where uh, Cato said he hears, uh, you know, three whatever. Marsha calls him thumps. Uh, yeah. Which, which is, think about that logically, okay? If you, in the pitch dark, run into an air conditioner one time, you are not going to back up and run <laughs> into it a second time and back up in the third time. I would imagine you would duck down underneath the freaking air conditioner, okay? You'd this, hope, right? <laughs> the things, yes, the, but the, that's what to me is so maddening these these things that people make into into their world obviously reasons of guilt you know oh well, the three thumps and there's the glove and and uh and and lee bailey just did such a phenomenal job on cross-examination and most people thought that lee quote lost his fastball Furman won that you should have seen him all mm. shamelessly fawning around Furman uh after his cross-exam and, uh, and I mean, just think if we had those tapes before the cross, how badly he would have been splayed out in front of the world. But no one wanted to believe everybody by then that by March of 95, oh, Simpson's guilty as hell. I mean, mm-hmm. they had him guilty, you know, and, and frankly, his impulsive move to go to the graveyard on the 17th was the beginning of the end for him ever, uh, having any reasonable doubt go his way, right? Everybody said, no, mm-hmm. he's, he, you know, that's his consciousness of guilt. Yes. And yeah, I could yeah, go yeah. on that that thing for hours, too, you know, the, the oh, he had a, he had a, a, a disguise in the trunk of the car or something. It's like, oh, okay, so he's going to drive, he's driving north on the 405. Was he going to drive all the way to frickin' Canada and then put <laughs> a disguise on? What do you yeah. think he's trying to escape? That just, that just, the stuff that just gets into the lore of the case and, and people just, uh, I'll tell you, I, I've talked to people that are otherwise very intelligent, educated people. I got a friend that's a math professor. He's more sure of Simpson's guilt than he is two and two's four. Yeah, and, right. and I told him that. I said, you're more, you're so convinced they slam out on my table, you know? Oh, you think everybody <laughs> did? I mean, ready to fist fight me. I just go, hey, listen, mm. you want to talk about this? What the facts are? What you just said is a load of shit. So let's go through it here. Come on over here. Look in these boxes, you know, here. And as I was putting a lot of stuff together for this book, and I, I have these binders that are the way I work, and I put, you know, my interviews, and I put the police in. If anything about, you know, Pierce, I would have a file for Pierce with all your mm-hmm. interviews and whatever else I found and blah, blah, blah. These cops could have eliminated O.J. Simpson as a suspect within the first week because usually that's what you you are the suspect. The wife, the husband or the ex-husband is number one until you eliminate them. Yeah. Well, the people that we used in our timeline, you know, late in 95 during trial, they came to the police first. They didn't come to us. They went mm. to the police and said, look, uh, here's what I saw. Here's what I do. And then, well, you're wrong. It couldn't, it couldn't have been that time. But, well, let me go back to my computer and look at when I wrote this letter. Oh, it's 1028. No, I'm, he, now I'm rather certain. Or No, here's my receipt from Metzaluna. I was walking. I walked. I walk with Mandela and Aronson a number of times down the street at the pace they were walking. And, you know, you put them right there before 1030. There's no dogs barking. There's no blood all over the sidewalks or anything like that yet. Um, Hydra, the hey, hey, hey guy. You know, when he says he saw a white vehicle, you don't think the cop wanted to make it a Ford Bronco? And he said, no, it's like this cheap. And I was in his basement garage of his apartment. 
He pointed right to the door. I told the cop, it's just like that right there. It was a little Jeep vehicle. Uh, Tom Lang, when he's discussing it's a Ford F-350, a white Ford F-350, don't, you don't think they would have probably said, no, I think you're mistaken, it's a Bronco. And they might have, but he, Tom owned 11 Ford vehicles in his life, so he knew the difference between a Bronco and a F-350. And so they could have spent time, God knows, I mean, I could do it. I'm a single guy all by myself out there. Way a couple of investigators, but you got the entire police department, the FBI, the California, whatever, the sheriff's office, everybody in law enforcement out there can go sit and, you know, put teams of people on all these, on all of these, uh, witness interviews, you know? Mm. And rather than challenge, you know, I mean, they challenged every one of these people and attacked them and belittled them. And it's kind of like, what's wrong with you people? These people could have helped you eliminate and put you on a trail. But you know what happened? Mark Furman put them on OJ's trail that night, and they never looked back. Mm. And had he turned himself in instead of the Bronco chase, you know, it would have been different. I'm rather certain he could have, you know, I would have said, come on in. You got your team in play. I'm in Chicago. Michael Biden leaves in L.A. already. You know, Shapiro's on board. He's got Lee Bailey on board. Uh, yeah. You know, you could have Very said, I got shy. a good team. I didn't do this. Yeah, I think Barry and them come about two weeks later. But, yeah, they're already been contacted, right? It's kind of like, hey, I didn't do this. I'm turning myself. I held a press conference in front of the jail. Here's, here's the team that I've assembled, and I didn't do this, and you will see this. And walk right mm. in, turn yourself in. Made them mm. look like fools. Instead, mm. he kind of turned himself into the fool by and I know the guy. I mean, he just was saying, you know, he's distraught and, and impulsive that he wants to say goodbye before he turns himself in. He wants to go to the grave. He's surrounded by cops. They turn around and head back to L.A. to turn themselves in. Not at 11 or 1 or whatever time it was supposed to be. He's going to be late, you know. So, the law no, and, enforcement... And it, it's funny, too, with the, you know, again, like you said, I mean, Furman kind of sets this in motion. And I understand yeah. there's this uh, reluctance with certain people, you know, that they, they don't want to or, or, or and I understand the whole you can frame a guilty man. That is possible. And the police do do that. Sure. Um, yeah. But, you know, e even if you take the, the Furman doesn't know about the alibi, take that out of the equation for a minute. You yeah. still have yeah. EDTA in some of the blood. We still have major yeah. flaws with um other cops, you know, it's not just Furman. It's not that it's a huge right. conspiracy, but you've got the, the, you know, the blue evidence bag, the piece of wood broken off from the Coles back gate. You've got the yeah. numerous issues with the, the uh, crime lab in LA. You know, you've got yeah. Van Adder wandering around with vials of blood. There's so many other yeah. things that, okay, even if Furman didn't know, you know, or, or even if Furman didn't plant the gloves, what about all these other things, you know? Um, yeah. you, do yeah. these not factor in? And furthermore, too, you know, if you if you go back and you, you look at, um, you know, Stephen Singular uh, quotes from it all the time in, in his book, the, you know, yeah. um, the, the psychological reports <laughs> on Furman, he was complete, oh, you know, yeah. you could, this guy was losing it, you know, or he, these delusions of grandeur, and, you know, that yeah. coupled with the fact that he got away with everything, torturing suspects, yeah. All these other sure. things. Then you know, when when he's at the the point of the the OJ case, I mean, he's untouchable. You know, I mean, don't forget yeah. that just after the OJ case, the whole Rampart scandal. They were the LAPD was framing you know black and Hispanic guys like it was going out of style. So I, I, you know, I, I again logically look at the character of Furman. Look at the yeah. fact that. Again, he shot, I believe when he shot Joseph Britton, it was like broad daylight, and then he planted a knife on him. It, at that point, who cares about putting a glove somewhere in the middle of the night right. where no one sees him? Well, like I say, he's a very cunning individual, and like most people in life, you, you work at your craft until you become really much more proficient. His craft was framing people. He worked and worked and worked. So he's not thinking like, oh, what, a, what if he has an alibi? He's thinking yeah, like, matter. I got this guy. No, it doesn't matter. I'm going to frame the shit out of this guy. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I mean, the biggest, and, you know, it is kind of a conspiracy. Now, I don't think they all got together, but, you know, they were being attacked as an institution. And so the biggest 
the biggest, odd, most obvious plant in the case to me was the stock. And forget about the, the blood on the back gate. You know, they they'll do they'll do backflips to explain the reason there's no blood on the back gate when Ralph Rokar, the crime scene photographer, is taking pictures that night. They claim it's the, because the lighting was bad or something. Right, okay? right. So that now after the after the preliminary hearing, when uh, someone told me that was friends with uh, a prosecutor and they're saying they were going batshit on Ben Adder and Lang. Saying this, all you got for Simpson is this glove. This is bullshit. This we need more than this. And voila! And now we get the blood on the back gate. And what do we get in August? We get blood on the stock for the first time. I'll never forget taking a picture out this OJ, the crime scene picture with the socks, and I think it's suspenders around the bed, and all that other stuff. He's going, "What the fuck is that? I don't. My my socks are not on the floor." Ask. The maid, you know, Nicole, I think, or not Nicole, uh, I forget the maid's name. Um, ask Gigi, I think it was. Gigi, ask Gigi. I travel all the time. I, when I, before I, you know, I get in the shower is the last thing I do to get ready to go travel. All my clothes are in the laundry, you mm. know? So they did with their best. And what was great was we caught later on. As, uh, uh, Alex Ford, I think, was the name of the videographer. He's one of the first guys on the scene. He's walking through the house with a video camera. There's no stocks on the floor. The bed's not disheveled like it was later in a picture, crime scene picture, okay? He's walking through this house. He's one of the first guys to walk through, quote, a crime scene, because they're calling OJ's a crime scene because of the glove. He's going through the house. It's, like, perfect. You know, you go up the stairs. It's white carpeting. It's, it's uh, white walls. There's no blood anywhere. And... And then OJ goes, I'm, that, how, those socks were put there and not planted, but he said, that's not how I left it. I left my socks in the hamper. I lay out the clothes I'm going to wear on the plane and I pack my suitcase where I'm going to wear on my trip. I take all my clothes, throw them in the hamper, unless the golf, I think he said if he had played golf, so he, sometimes if he wears those bugle boys in the golf course, he, well, I don't mess them up, so I'll, I'll hang them back up. But, you know, his underwear, his socks, all that gets thrown in the hamper. And it's going ballistic when he's going, I, see, you got to get to the bottom. And then we found out, uh, we got to the bottom of, we saw that Ford had, had gone through with a video camera. And, uh, that's on June 13th in the morning. There's no stocks on the floor. Okay. Mm-hmm. So, so then later on June 13th, voila, there is stocks on the floor. So the police and the criminalists recover these stocks and examine them. And guess what they found? No blood. Okay. That's June 13th. Then a couple weeks later, when B- Michael Bodden and uh, Barbara Wolf was his assistant at the time, um, June 24th of 94, Michelle Kessler, she shows Bodden and Wolf the socks. As, you know, we got our team to go look at some of the evidence. No blood, no nothing. And, you know, then on five days later, June 29th, Kessler, Matheson, and Yamauchi all inspect the socks together. And guess what? In their report, no blood observed. Then, lo and behold, in August, I want to say it was the 4th of 94, is when it's seen uh, for the first time by the LAPD. August. Now, we don't hear anything about this until it's announced on NBC in September, right after Ito uh, rules against this on the motion to suppress, but does say Ben Adder had a reckless disregard for the truth, which is a euphemistic way of saying you're <laughs> yeah, a fucking liar. <laughs> okay? You're a fucking liar. Mm. This is all a load of shit. You lied on top of lies. You lie that Arnell says he, he uh, or, or you lie when you say in the affidavit he left unannounced. And the judge, before he signs the warrant, says, are you sure it was unannounced, that he left unannounced, he didn't have a plan? Oh, then he writes over it, no, after speaking with Arnell. Well, uh, uh, Pat, we're, we're, we're coming up on the break right now, and I okay. want to continue um, uh, in the, okay. the second hour specifically with the, okay. the, the socks. Uh, and the blood evidence, and then we'll get to the Bruno Magli shoes because there's a lot there. Uh, so uh, okay. stay tuned. Uh, in the second hour, we'll be joined again with uh, Pat McKenna for more on all of this. So uh, stay tuned.
again. Practically narcotic. Freedom. Oh, yes. I like very much. Radio. You're an American institution. American Freedom Radio. Since the beginning, civilizations have risen and fallen. Rome, ancient Persia, Mongolia, Britain, and now America. Befallen by natural disasters, broken families, moral decay, lack of preparedness and conflict. Don't let this happen to you. Are you prepared? Would you like to help others prepare? AmericanSurvivalWholesale.com is looking for distributors. Email BugOutAmerica at USA.com. Go to AmericanSurvivalWholesale.com, a veteran-owned and operated company. But do it today. We all know that they're not telling us the truth. So stand up for your rights, demand the real medicine, and your right to use it and grow it. This is Rick Sensen, and you're listening to American Freedom Radio. And I hope people support American Freedom Radio. And I hope people vote with their dollars and really understand the value of having American Freedom Radio. Because that's my family. If you love me at all, Jack Blood, support American Freedom Radio. Like, my family has literally disowned me. <laughs> American Freedom Radio, Danny and Don and those guys, those are my actual family. So please, please support these guys because they have all the technology. They have all these great things that they're going to do. But obviously, they can't do it all by themselves. So not only would I like to see you support them, I'd like to see you retweet them and repost them and really get involved and get on the, the bandwagon, so to speak, on doing that do-it-yourself promotion because they're a do-it-yourself radio network, and, uh, and we just need that so much. And when we're not invading some sovereign nation or setting it on fire from the air, which is more fun for our Nintendo pilots, then, then we're usually declaring war on something here at home. Did you ever notice that about us? We love to declare war on things here in America. Anything we don't like about ourselves, we declare war on it. We don't do anything about it. We just declare war on it. It's the only metaphor, the only metaphor we have in our public discourse for solving problems, declaring war. We have to declare a war on everything. We have a war on crime, the war on poverty, the war on litter, the war on cancer, the war on drugs. But you ever notice we got no war on homelessness, huh? No war on homelessness. You know why? There's no money in that problem. No money to be made off of the homeless. If you can find a solution, if you can find a solution to homelessness where the corporate swine and the politicians could steal a couple of million dollars each, you see the streets of America begin to clear up pretty quick. I'll guarantee you that. I will guarantee you that. You're listening to AmericanFreedomRadio.com, the network who perseveres in delivering intelligent debate, constructive dialogue with true independence. The freedom to broadcast the truth is not free at all. So what is American Freedom Radio worth to you? The empowering information with fun, honest and pure integrity behind it provides an example to follow. Friendships to flourish with the moral altruism that pulls no punches. The hosts sacrifice and show remarkable discipline in their duty to deliver quality radio and service to the community with strength, wisdom and loyalty. The founders of AFI wish to thank you personally for sharing your views and insights to make the best radio and alternative media. Now it's time for you to give something back and play a vital role in the future of America. Be as generous with us as we've been with you. Click on the donate banner at AmericanFreedomRadio.com or volunteer by emailing AmericanFreedomRadio at Ymail.com. Vaccine, psychotropic drugs and artillery batteries not included. Launch We're now in the approach phase. Everything looking good. Need to drop the all out. Control is good. Five. Right to count. Three. Two. One. Prepare your mind to experience American Freedom Radio. Pa 
Policy Radio, offering a unique perspective on everything. Geopolitics, culture creation, the reality of the world we live in. Coming to you live from New York City, your host, Pierce Redmond. Okay, everybody, welcome back to Porkins Policy Radio. I am your host, Pierce Redman. If you are just joining us right now in the second hour, we are joined uh, once again by a good friend of the show, Pat McKenna, private investigator. We are, of course, uh, discussing a uh, a favorite topic of Pat and I's, the the O.J. Simpson case. And uh, just towards the end of the uh, first hour there, Pat, uh, you were talking about... Uh, the the uh, bloody socks, uh, the blood on the back right. gate, uh, and these right. are uh, very important pieces in to understanding the uh, the, the trial. And that uh, sort of reminded me of the uh, second uh, sort of uh, uh, thing that uh, this listener Simon wanted us to address. Um, I'll I'll start with the the first one because it's a pretty easy one. Uh, to okay. to answer, and then we'll and then I kind of want to get into a bit more about the the importance of this. But he he asked us to address this point that again, Marsha Clark makes in the OJ Made in America documentary series. This is in episode four, and Clark says, "quote In your blood right now, there is a low level of EDTA because it is in everything you eat. It's in the laundry detergent. It's everywhere. You're going to find EDTA no matter what you do." But the defense is trying to insinuate that somebody took the blood that had been drawn from Simpson's arm and took that test tube and sprinkled it all over the crime scene. And it's ridiculous. Um, and there's another uh, a part to to Simon uh, his question, but also that. Um, uh, well, I guess it's just that, that, you know, there is EDTA in your blood already. Therefore, it doesn't matter if EDTA pops up. And just quickly, and then I'll throw it to you, Pat, uh, I'll just say okay. this, Simon, uh, if anyone ever asks you that again, you can point them to uh, an exchange between uh, Blazer, who was with the defense, uh, questioning yep. uh, FBI Special Agent Robert Martz, where um, Blazer asked, what is the concentration of EDTA in a purple top tube, Martz, somewhere between 1,000 and 2,000 parts per million? Blazer, would you agree that if someone had 2,000 parts per million EDTA in their blood, they would be dead? Marts. Well, for any sustained period of time, I think they uh, they use it also for transfusions. I don't know the exact amount that they use. It would not be a good idea, I don't think, to have that amount in your blood. I agree with that. Blazer, does that number bear any relationship at all to what the FDA allows in terms of EDTA as a food adi- additive, Marts. Um, no, no, I don't believe it does. So again, <laughs> Marcia Clark is 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 right in saying that EDTA is found in that you know it's, I believe it, it's found sometimes in bottled water. It is found in other things, but you'd be dead in the amounts that they found on the right. socks and the back gate. And the other yeah. thing, you know, to this to keep in mind as well. Um, uh, with the is that only the socks in the back gate were retested, correct, Pat? I think so. I think you're right. I think that's the only thing. They might have retested other stuff and didn't tell us. Mm. And I want I want to I want to end this show on a big bombshell about uh, testing too. So I don't oh, okay, great, that. <laughs> wonderful. Yeah. Um, so yeah. I, I, you know, so first off, you know, again, Marsha Clark is totally. <laughs> Wrong. Okay, and this is also, you know, people should remember, uh, FBI agent Robert Martz was originally supposed to be a prosecution's witness, uh, and this yeah. is when the prosecution sort of asked the FBI to disprove these claims, and then when they tested and they were able to actually <coughs> confirm the claims of the defense, the defense called them as their witness. But um, yeah. and, and Pat, you were, as I said in the towards the end of the the first hour, there we were talking about the, the, the socks. And as you rightfully point out, the socks don't appear uh, in the original video. The, the socks don't appear to have blood on them. Uh, and then suddenly the socks do have blood. The same is true for the back gate. 
there is no yeah. blood on the back eight in the original photos, then all of a sudden there is blood. And when both of these pieces of evidence are retested with experts from the FBI in, yeah. you know, uh, chemical engineering and all that stuff, they find that there's EDTA in both the socks and in the back eight. And this is on yeah. the heels of, as you point out, the fact that they, the only evidence they have are the gloves, which are beyond suspect. So, yeah. um, you know, just to kind of elaborate on this, Pat, because this is a really important sort of uh, component of this whole thing. You know, people bring up the, the, the socks and, and, and things like that, but what they don't realize or they don't want to admit is that, you know, the, the, how the blood got in those socks is beyond you know i don't under you, there's no reasonable explanation so i don't know kind of elaborate on that a bit pat okay well first of all the blood on the sock is all nicole's blood there's no oj blood and there's no goldman blood it's all one big drop of, of nicole's blood which conveniently there's a ton of that blood that was sitting around in the lab uh could very easily be done and it was our theory at the time, since we never heard boo about this, and we've had three experts look at these socks after finding out from OJ that I didn't have my socks there. So we start looking at that. And uh, supposedly even Marsha Clark didn't know about that until September. Okay? So somebody in the LAPD, quote, finds, unquote, this blood uh, for the first time um, and, and think think that one through if this stock is worn in a double murder where you're wrestling a guy for five to seven minutes don't you think he might have a little blood on your sock don't you think there might be some trace evidence from that little garden area where they were struggling there might be some soil or something from yeah. the crust stain not one big fat drop of uh nicole's dna which by the way was seen to go through and through the sock so you know uh, how does that happen if you're wearing it? The blood can't go through your ankle to the other side of the sock. So it just made more common sense that someone in the lab must have salted that sock a little bit, especially after hearing how we're trashing the LAPD. Remember, the time is, is uh, oh, everybody's blaming the defense for trashing this fine elite team of detectives. But everybody start wearing those dumb blue uh, ribbons. Yeah, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, and we're supporting our police department and this damn uh, scheme team, dream team, all that shit they made up in the media. Uh, somehow we're besmirching these wonderful – and don't get me wrong. No, not every cop is like this. But when you got a, co a department that heavy, you, don't, you can't tell me there's not a bad apple in there. We already know Mark Furman's own words track some actual facts that happened. That Rampart thing, he's bragging about it. Okay? Mm -hmm. And then they find out later. So – so, uh, anyway, back to the stock. Um, it doesn't make a media leak until September. And that's, like I said, right after Edo rules. Marcia gets on to, gets up in court. That's impossible. It hasn't even sent to the lab yet. It can't possibly be possible. And the next day, they come back out again with all kinds of confidence. Stacey Savage from NBC, I have confirmed this. Well, um, how can you confirm this? Uh, Miss Reporter, uh, only you hear it from the flack, who evidently she was having an affair with, which I could give a shit about. But she was breaking all these stories. Now, to me, to come back out the second day and say, uh, I'll go back to my source and go, holy shit, everybody's telling me this is impossible to have Nicole's blood on James Marsh's uh, on court saying they haven't been sent to a lab yet. They come out the very next day and she, she reconfirms, I have reconfirmed this, Nicole's blood is on the stock. Okay, it has not been sent to the lab. It was sent November 17th to Selmark. So, or, I'm sorry, September 26th, it was first sent out for DNA. And then it was about a month later when Selmark reported back that there was DNA on the stock. That was November. They were sent out September 26th, right after the leak of the press. So, what, so here it is. These stocks are sitting from June 13th till September Unbeknownst to the prosecution, now, it is known to someone in LAPD that there's a blood stain on the sock. That's August 4th. So someone in the LAPD, we always suspected it was Michelle Kessler because her husband was a robbery, robbery homicide cop, and she would be sophisticated out of the crew of those guys to perhaps do that. 
uh, and so here you go from June until September. Marcia evidently doesn't know anything about this. And then it blows up. We go crazy in court. And she's going, Judge, that, that's not true. Stocks haven't even been sent out to be tested yet. And then the next day they send it out. And a month later, Stomark reports back, yeah, Nicole was in there. So, mm. uh, again, common sense, timing of when stuff is found, you know, like the blood on the back gate. When is it found? After the prelim. After this meeting, this high-level meeting where they're all yeah. jumping the detect, saying this is not, a, this is bullshit, this glove, this single glove. And, not, and you can't tell me. Uh, with a straight face that, that these people didn't know about Mark Furman and what kind of a cop he was. You know, they did everything to protect this guy. They could not do this case without him because it would have been the biggest hole in the case. So they had to do it with him, and they all participated in this, it changing the story a little bit or saying Mark Furman could not have planted the glove. There was He was surrounded by cops the entire evening, and we find out after they fight us for months in September when we take the deposition of Rokar, the photographer, that Berman indeed was alone with mm -hmm. Rokar. Okay? So those kinds of things just happened every day. You know, it's just like we were like shoveling sand against the tide, and all this sand is nothing but bullshit coming our way. We're looking <laughs> at the facts, you know, going, well, wait a minute. That doesn't make sense with this. And, you know, here's all these people that came forward the day or two after the murder. Let's keep these people, you know, let's look at this. Oh, look, the cops interviewed the same people. Look at their report. They're learning some of the same things I learned. All those people in Chicago that were interviewed by cops, no cut on his finger till he left. <coughs> Excuse me. The hotel people, the people he signed an autograph with. <clears throat> the people that were mulling around at baggage claim, waiting for their luggage when it landed in Chicago. OJ sitting on a bench with the kid from Perth, Jim Merrill, uh, and you know, it's amicably signing autographs for people that come up to him. Now, where's all the tape, by the way, from from Chicago? Where's all the, the video? Because remember back in those days, you could, and Jim Merrill did, meet his guest, O.J. Simpson, as the door opened from the plane. So you could all go all the way down to the gate, remember, meet your family or whatever, mm -hmm. back in those days, not, not like today. So he was able to meet, walk together all the way, you know, no blood on the finger, walk all the way down, on film everywhere. Uh, just just imagine yourself. Just go back to when you got off a plane one time and walked somewhere. Just imagine had you just slaughtered and murdered two people. What, what would be going through your mind at that moment? You would be freaking out, you know? <laughs> and he's just signing autographs and all this sort of stuff with people that are shaking his hand and, and there's no cuts or anything, and, you know, then he gets the word, and he goes crazy in the room and breaks the glass, and he's on the phone with this gal, and he doesn't even know yet how there's a second murder victim. He just knows his wife's been killed. He doesn't know if it's a car wreck. He doesn't know anything other than we have your children at the police department. Mm. So he doesn't know anything. Of course, they turn that around uh, into, O.J. never asked how she was killed, you know? So what does that mean? He's in a freaking panic. You know, he doesn't, he's, everything's probably going through your mind. If you got a call tomorrow uh, that your dearest one is, is dead, you know, you're going to start to panic or no, not panic, but oh my God, you know, just like he mm. did. You don't start saying, well, and, well, and even that is, what happened? even that's not entirely true. He did ask and, you know, they, they, and the detective you well, talked to said, I can't tell you. Exactly. I, I, I misspoke there. He did ask. And, uh, you know, but he didn't say, well, do you have any evidence? Do you have DNA? Do you have the <laughs> weapon? Do you have the clothes? Yeah. You know, did, you know. So right. I forgot going with this, but it just the, the the demeanor was one of someone that just got off red eye. He's exhausted. He's always traveling. I was traveling a lot back then, too. I could relate to everything he was saying in his uh, statement to the police. They go, well, yeah, I, I, at the time I was the just divorced, and I'm thinking, well, I don't, I don't have an alibi the night before I travel somewhere. I'm living alone in a friend's house. So I packed my yeah. clothes to go to the airport. I don't really have an alibi other than I was at my friend's house, mm. you know? Um, and so all those kind of things just kept adding up, and we just kept going back to what we had and going, what, the, what are you talking about? There's blood on the socks. 
you know, Nicole's blood on the socks. And then we go to our expert, Michael. Here's your, you know, you did your lab report. These guys look with a freaking micro, uh, microscope, okay? They looked at these, examined them. Henry Lee with the little, you know, the, the glass, the Sherlock Holmes glass, right, that they all make mm-hmm. fun of them with. The guy's meticulous, okay? They're examining these socks for anything, right? Anything. Lint from the dryer could have been on those socks. Well, they haven't been washed yet, but there could be anything on these socks, but there would be trace evidence, you would think, uh, if they're worn in a double murder. Yeah, soil, stuff. leaves, yeah, something, soil. Yes, pebbles. Yeah. yeah. So, anyway, the sock to me was always the biggest load of bullshit that they put in that case, and they kind of got away. Well, they didn't get away with it because I think the jurors who – you know, somebody was arguing with me the other night that jurors took, didn't take long enough. And I was thinking, these jurors took an oath. They sat sequestered. They didn't get to look at the bullshit on TV at night or in the day or the tabloids or the newspapers. So they basically sat in that courtroom and paid attention to everything. And nine months later of, you know, days of bullshit, they, they didn't need nine months to deliberate to even out the nine months they were sitting there. They said, Dodd, nah, you know, Furman's a liar. They thought they knew he was a liar right off the bat. I think they really had trouble with Van Adder's testimony more than Furman, you know? Mm. So I, at least I've seen some interviews or something that I, I kind of recall that, that uh, someone said something about why is Van Adder going all over town with blood in his pocket when he could have walked yeah. across the yeah, yeah, back yeah. and <laughs> posted it into evidence, you know? I mean, mm. come on. What what does blood do uh, in the heat, the hot sun, and all that? It degrades down to nothing. So why would you have this valuable piece of evidence and not get it right over to the lab? What are you doing riding all over L.A., leaving it in the car and in the heat and everything else, you know? Especially if you're a detective for as long as Phil was. Like, he's got a 20-some-odd-year detective. Not a, you know, he's got to know a little bit about preserving important stuff. Like, you know, they're they're palming their foreheads when O.J. says, yeah, I'll give you blood. I'll give you whatever. Blood, take my lie detectors, whatever. I got guns. He, I think even that day, the next day, they, they might have been shot. He says, well, I got guns. Yeah. You, got, you, can, you can do whatever, meaning you can take them all, finger, you know, go test them all. So, mm. you know, I got to think. I, I don't know what to think about Ben Adder taking the blood uh, all over town, but it just made no sense. And I think he even testified when Shapiro asked him, have you ever done this in a case before, taking the blood all around? He said, not that I recall. So this is the one yeah. and only time, you know, I think these guys got swept up in it. Okay, Mark Sperman planted that glove, and by, you know, 8 o'clock in the morning, they're doing search warrants. They think they got their man. They they don't even know about the cut on the finger yet. They just think that glove, we got it. Ben Harris calling Marsha. Marsha's heading out to the Rockingham. They think they got their man. We got all this, and they still call it a mountain of evidence. And they had shit. They had nothing, and uh, and they just it went off like a like a, a, a high speed bullet train, you know, and never slowed down. Never. And we're looking at it like it's going off the tracks every five minutes, and they're just steaming away, you know. Oh, the the. Uh, the coroner testified it could have been two different knives used. Okay, we never hear from him again. We bring yeah, in Watchman yeah. for like freaking eight days. Testify with the guys holding the ruler and all that dumb shit they were doing, uh, trying to reenact their various theories. Uh, anyway. Well, I, you know, you know, on, I, on that notepad, I mean, we were talking about socks. So, of course, uh, you know, one usually wears socks with their shoes. And this is uh, yeah. another. A thing that did listener Simon wanted us to address, and it's something that I get all the time from uh, detractors. I get this all the time from my friends, anybody that knows yeah. that I'm into this stuff, or that I, you know, that I I, yeah. I know people that were involved with the case. They're always like, "Oh, what about the Bruno Magli shoes? The shoes? The shoes?" Yeah. And yeah. I think okay. that almost nobody that mentions the shoes actually understands anything about what was brought up. In the the civil trial by uh, right. Daniel Petricelli with the the Bruno right. Magli shoes, there's this whole okay that it's I guess it's pretty fair to say that a pair of size twelve Bruno Magli shoes were you you know were, someone was wearing them at the, the murder. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So and here's 
Okay. Well, no, no. Go ahead, Pat. You, you, you take it from there because I mean I have my own well, my own thoughts on this, but uh, you okay. elaborate. Okay. Okay. So, just looking back at what I did, the first day I got in Los Angeles, got off a plane, got picked up by John McNally, another investigator. We drove out to uh, Rockingham. Uh, had a few discussions with the other investigator, and then it was either that day or the next day. John and I went to OJ's office on San Vicente and met with Kathy Randa and Skip Taft. Now, John's been a detective for, you know, at that time, 20 or 30 years longer than me, a New York detective. And we sat and said, you know, they take care of all of these arrangements for everything, you know. It's not like they're a big management company that's got a, that got 32 golfers, five football players, blah, blah, blah. Kathy and Skip had one client, one client only, O.J. Simpson. They knew his whole life story. They knew where he went. And we said, how about receipts for shoes? We need to go through every pair of shoes this guy's bought because at that time we're hearing about these footprints, right? And these Bruno mm-hmm. Molly shoes. Now, oh, I'm sitting there wearing Bruno Molly shoes, but they're a dress shoe at the time, you know? And I remember saying, I got Bruno Molly's on right now. Does he, I probably could find a receipt there if I probably put him on a credit. How does OJ buy shoes? And he, like everybody else, he, there was credit cards and all of that stuff. So, we never could find anything that he had ever purchased these shoes, right? And furthermore, the FBI now conducts the most exhaustive, comprehensive shoe print, footprint investigation in the history of the FBI. Those are their words, okay? I, we had three to 5,000 pages of discovery. They went to the Bruno Mali factory and then went forward from there. They, they looked at every size 12. Uh, Lorenzo style Hilda Soul shoe. I forget how many there were. And they tracked them through the barcodes and they went out from the factory to where everyone, was, every shoe was. And they looked through Europe because as you remember, OJ was a uh, NBC guy during the uh, Olympics in Barcelona. Yep. And so they went all over Europe, all over the world, right? Not a pair of shoes comes back to OJ Simpson. Secondly, don't you think that someone that sold O.J. Simpson a pair of those shoes would say, everybody in the world's watching this trial say, holy shit, I sold him Reeboks. Let me go get what he signed an autograph when he, when he bought these. You know, O.J. Simpson signed autographs everywhere. Don't you think he would have bought these shoes and signed an autograph for the shoe salesman or the shoe salesman would come forward or the credit card would come forward or the store, you'd be able to find out what store these were sold in. Don't forget, we had all kinds of stores that, there were some in Southern California that sold these. Okay. So they went to all those stores. They got, they examined all that stuff. There's not a person on this planet until what, a year and a half later that says, Oh, I have these pictures. Now, why didn't those people that allegedly got these pictures come forward and share with us the contact sheets? In other words, when I take 42 shots at the ball game, they're in sequence on the, nowadays, I don't know if it does it that way, but that's how we saw Rokars and Mark Furman, and it was four in the morning because it's contact mm-hmm. sheet shit. So why didn't these guys come forward and say, hey, look at this. I took pictures of this guy. Well, you know, if you're a photographer, you got to say to yourself, Jesus, I'm in Buffalo. I, I, got, I got a million pictures of O.J. Simpson, okay? Let me go through my stuff, okay? So none of that happens until we're in a civil trial. And, of course, Fujisaki doesn't give a hoot about contact sheets or anything. We get these photocopies of some pictures and, you know, claiming that these are, these, oh, this is a, the case closed. Well, you know, mm-hmm. you guys are graphics guys. They're graphic. They could have put Prince Charles in those freaking shoes, okay? <laughs> yeah. With the right kind of, you know, like today it's even better. These guys can copy $100 bills and they can do anything with graphics. But that's probably in the earlier days, but still... Logic tells you that if I'm a photographer <clears throat> and I'm watching this trial and it's O.J. Simpson, and a photograph of O.J. Simpson is not something you would forget if you're a photographer. You've got your little portfolio. There's all my pictures of the uh, Olympics. There's all my, you know, I mean, the real good photographers do that. So why wouldn't they say, let me go through my stuff. Jesus, I might have something important here. So you don't get any of that until late in the game. And one of the guys that came forward, Flammer Stull, I forget which one, his own mother called him a lot, said he couldn't be trusted. So <laughs> I, I don't trust those 
when you hold up those pictures without any other evidence behind them, and they claim they had uh, magazines with these pictures in them. Well, I way back when, I got every single uh, Buffalo Bills, uh, I didn't have a hardback book, uh, everything that the Buffalo Bills put out, right? So there's no no shoe pictures. And the, and the game that these claim uh, was the Dolphins, and I live in, in Florida and I have a good friend that, that worked for Stu Weinstein, who I think is still a chief of security for the Dolphins, former FBI guy. And my buddy's a former cop, and, and they get a lot of these. So when these guys mess up, he used to get a lot of the case. So I called him and got pulled of Weinstein. Says, "Is it possible? Do you guys take pictures on the sideline? Do you have, you know, do you have your own video guy walking around?" And they looked. They didn't have anything from that game. Um, and so to me, it's always the bulk of evidence on my side of the case from the FBI investigation all the way forward and the common sense logic stacked up against two guys that show up late in the game, supposedly with 20 different pictures of this guy in these shoes. Um, to me, it doesn't make any sense. I think the pictures were doctored. They can't prove they weren't doctored, that's for sure. They can't come in and say, no, here's the contact sheet. Here's, you know, I took a picture of the cheerleader here, then it was here, and here's the crowd, there's the the guy's warming up, the pap, here's the presentation in center in the midfield, there's OJ, and there's all these guys. You know, here it is, right? Here. No, they never produced anything like that. They just showed some, they came up with some pictures, which, you know, you need to give me a lot more than that crap to make that mm-hmm. the case, okay? Because if Simpson doesn't have time to commit two murders and didn't commit two murders, I don't give a shit if you put the shoes, a knit hat on him, and a knife in his hand. And show me that picture. That's not going to prove <laughs> squat to me, right, compared to the other stuff. So that was kind of the thing. We recognized first day in California, or second day in California, that those shoe prints would be important. And we go to his house, and we're looking through every shoe he's got in the closet. And the, and the prosecution and the cops had already searched this home twice, okay? So if these are such important pieces of evidence that the FBI spent, you know, who knows what kind of money on their investigation. And you got cops crawling the place. They didn't take a pair of shoes. Tom Lang took a pair of Reeboks out of there. There's a video of him carrying them out to his house, or he took them home to his house. But, oh, yeah, yeah. And he's, he's walking around with the shoes in the back of his car for a couple of days. Yeah, which are, which are Reeboks, for God's sake. No one ever said that. You could look and see these aren't Reeboks. But in this statement, they asked him about his shoes. I think he might have said it Reeboks. Or, no, maybe they were talking about his pants. But um, you should, you know, it's like uh, OJ's like a Melda Marcus. I went in his, you know, in his closet. <laughs> I mean, like fifty pairs of Bugle Boys, all one inch apart from each other, like a neat nick. You know what I mean? Like nothing out of place. His shoes, uh, you know, racks of shoes, dozens of pairs of shoes. Um, why didn't they grab every pair of shoes? You know, that could have been. They already have him in custody, you know, maybe they don't have him in custody yet, but they have a search warrant. Now they have a second search warrant. Not only they don't get the shoes out of there, they don't take the frickin' knife that he bought at Ross Cutler that's sitting on top of his, uh, not armoire, but, you know, a little, like a dresser that's in the closet there. It's a big closet, mm-hmm. huge closet. His closet's like my living room, right? Uh, <laughs> with, you know, suits over here and clothes here and shoes up here and a, like a big table in the middle with, Cup links and all that sort of stuff, you know, a high end, you know, uh, bedroom closet for a, for a, for a guy. And, uh, and so the shoes really don't bother me that much. That's, that doesn't make the case, you know, because I, I don't believe in those pictures for 20 seconds. Mm. And if they were so certain of them, uh, <laughs> excuse me, <clears throat> if I'm Petrocelli or any of these guys on this team, I don't care about the amount of them. I want to document those so it doesn't blow up in my face. But nothing was blown up in their face. Like if I had these, I would I would get more documentation. I wouldn't say, oh, look what I got. I got pictures of some other guy doing the murder, you know. Mm. I would go, where did the pictures come from? Who's the photographer? What's his background? Show me the negatives. Show me the contact sheets. Prove this up to me before I even turn it over to the lawyers because I don't want to look like a fool. But they just mm. went with this kind of stuff. And, and, you know, and then they get away with it. Like, everybody's, ah, the shoes. He had to do, look at the shoes, the shoes, the shoes. That's all people talk about. Therefore, he must be guilty because they got a picture of him in shoes from some graphics designer. 
and, and, and that's that, that, no, and and that's something I really want to uh, kind of stress to people is that uh, everyone knows of the, this this infamous picture with the the Bruno Mali shoes. Yeah. But right. you know, I would I first off, there's a bunch of pictures floating around the internet uh, that purport to be the original picture that was shown in this in the civil trial, and it's a wrong, it's a different photo. You know, he's got different pants on. Uh-huh. He's at a, uh-huh. a Cincinnati Bengals game. I don't know why that photo appears. Then there's the one right. of OJ walking, uh, and then there's the yep. one the the one that is that is supposed to be definitive is him on the field. Uh, standing with a bunch of guys, you know, a from group the, of guys. From the yeah, yeah. That sure. photo is almost imp- – I've not been able to find, uh, you know, through Google or anything, that particular photo, just like an image, you know, yeah. on- online. Yeah. I-, I don't know where right. it is. But, again, people believe that they – and I think this is one of the things, you know, something Brian and I have talked about quite a bit yeah. is the perception. People – it, almost to the degree that they imagine in their head, oh, I, I've seen the photo. But, you know, I want to tell people, do you, who are the people standing on OJ's side? Is it three people on go. the right, two on the left? Yeah. I mean, tell me, well, you know, what, uh, what, what, what's their ethnicity? Are, are they all wearing suits? Are some of them wearing jackets? I mean, yeah. seriously, you know, try and, and I think you'll, you'll find a lot of people actually have never even seen the photo in question. Then right. when you find the photo, I come on, you tell me with a straight face, you're a hundred percent you would send that man to jail or to the electric chair because you're convinced yeah. those are Bruno Molly's shoes. If you can really sit there with a straight face and you know and imagine what if it was your your husband or your your oh, your yeah. brother, yeah. your best friend, would you yeah. honestly tell me, Oh, I'm convinced he did it because those are the right shoes. Yeah. And furthermore too, in that, that civil uh trial they they bring Sam Poser, who worked at Bloomingdale's, who was deposed for the civil trial, and he uh, couldn't right. remember if he had sold them. You know, and, and he right. even remembers saying, I didn't want to show him those shoes because I didn't think that they would uh, be good to wear in cold climates like Buffalo, where O.J. was right. obviously going back and forth because, you know, he's sort of yeah. like, a, a, you know, a, a spokesperson right. for the Buffalo Bills. So he didn't even right. want to show him those shoes. And right. then it, it what it, it pops up in the National Enquirer. They get a hold exactly. of it beforehand, right? Uh, you, you know, so none of that really. I know it's like you said, Pat. You hear the the shoes, the shoes, the picture. He did it, the shoes. Sure. But sure. there's there's really you know, and 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 Petricelli is so great at just you know running his mouth and making it seem yeah. like th- these bits of nothing evidence are, are somehow like, I, you know, and, and I don't know if this is true. Maybe you would know, Pat. I, I read, um, I think it was in, in footwear news.com, which was, uh, actually has a great article we'll link to, um, oh. quoting from, from poser on this. And in that article, it says it was stipulated in the civil trial that the, the shoes in that picture are Bruno Mali shoes? Is that true, or is that because um, I couldn't imagine that that you know that Simpson's d- defense would would stipulate to that? No, I don't think we. Well, you know, I only worked a criminal. The only time I was in the civil was for the shoes because I had I had everything. Ca- I got five thousand pages of discovery on the shoes, right? Broken down into mini files and mini binders and and all this sort of stuff about. All the people they did find about the shoes, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I came out there for that, and that was our big question. Well, uh, first thing I said, where's the contact sheets? Because that's how we proved Furman was, oh, no, Fujisaki won't let us look at this. Well, when we looked at these pictures over lunch, I said, ah, that's, if we, you can't prove them up. This is, sounds like bullshit. And, you know, we didn't have the picture that the now is out there with these 10 men on the field, right? That wasn't one of them that I saw. And, and think that through. Who are these 10 people? And ask anybody that's ever been honored at a football game, you don't just go down there by yourself. Your family's invited down on the field. You're not, maybe on the sidelines. You don't get involved. You mean to tell me the only people on this planet that took pictures of OJ during that game hmm. were these two photographers? No one from those other 10 men didn't have a family member. Hey, let me get a picture of you and OJ. Let me get a picture yeah, of you yeah, and OJ. Yeah. You know? I mean, come on. Uh, and so there's no other photographers other than these two guys on the planet that have come forward to say, hey, I got pictures. You know, I, my dad was the guy, the guy, the third guy on the right. And we were out on the field. My, here's my brother and sister. We took 40 pictures that day. 
There's mm-hmm. pictures of OJ. Them, you know, OJ's a big celebrity. So you're going to, yeah, your dad's getting honored, but Jesus, look who's in the front and center. You know, <laughs> yeah, OJ's yeah, yeah. there. I mean, like, can I take a now? Well, now maybe they didn't do selfies like they used to, but you know, <laughs> no one, no one else took a picture of OJ with their dad or with their brother or something like that. Or oh, anyways, uh, no, no, I, I know, and, and that's that's always the issue I have with these things. You know, like people that say the socks, but the the shoes, and it's it, it's yeah. I, and it really is, it's, it, it again goes to this like disconnect that so many people have. I think with criminal investigations in general, you know, people are very yeah. willing to kind of, um, believe whatever is put out by the media. In this case, you know, the National Enquirer comes sure. up with a photo. So suddenly, yeah. you know, OJ is guilty of the crime of the Real. century. Yeah. Um, you right. know, people's willingness to accept, you know, yeah. w- w- essentially what they want to believe. You know, and I can, yeah. and I, I'm sure Petricelli was sitting there like, oh great, you know, I, I want him to have a pair of these shoes. So here's a picture yeah. that where he's, and I mean, come, you look at the picture, they could be any number of dress shoes. Oh, it's, it's not yeah. like, you know, these are not like Louboutin shoes with a red, you know, right. a red sole yeah. underneath. There's nothing like right. super discernible about the, the this picture that right. you can point to oh well you know here's the you know the particular laces or uh mm-hmm. th- this accent on the shoes i mean they look like any number of dress shoes uh and, and, well, you said and the the size 12 size 12 bruno molly shoes that came out in the criminal trial so where were yeah. these these guys again you right. know everybody and their mother came out of the woodwork to yeah. uh you know be a part of the trial but nobody right. has anything to say about the shoes until what it, what it was the civil trials at least a year year and a half later. Oh yeah, this was well over a year later I think that the that this so called bombshell evidence came up and and go back to the whole beginning of the case. So O.J. Simpson is wearing uh, leather shoes to the recital, black slacks. I think he had a black cardigan sweater and a white shirt or something, if I recall the picture of him and Sydney. Okay, so then he goes home and changes out of the loafers, leaves the dress socks on, and puts on these Bruno Mollies and gets a knit cap and heads <laughs> over there and then kills two people and leaves the scene in his Bronco, covered in blood up to his eyelashes, and gets back home and says, oh, shit, I got a glove. Let me get rid of the glove. Uh, <laughs> bangs into the air conditioner three times and then says, ah, fuck it, drops the glove. But where does the shoes go? Because he didn't come home barefoot, right? So he he doesn't come. So the Bruno Mali shoes should have been all under that air conditioner, okay? So uh, Furman causes. You know, I think Lee was great in his cross examination. Furman caused eighteen sets of footprints uh, to walk up and down by that air conditioner, thereby ruining any chance to find evidence of Bruno Mali shoes. So that carried further. So then he gets rid of the shoes. Uh, and puts the socks in the hamper. So he takes the socks he was wearing in a double murder and just puts them in a hamper or leaves them on the floor and leaves his bed a little disheveled like that one crime scene shows. But he's able to get these shoes and whatever knife and whatever other clothing he had. Oh, but wait, where do we shower and get rid of all this blood? In my bathroom, I guess, and there's no blood there. There's nothing on the carpet. So I had one guy say to me, well, I know what he did. He, he washed off behind... uh Bundy, and then got in his car and took off. I said, well, that doesn't make sense. I mean, if he did that, look at all the other stuff that proves he couldn't have done that. And 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 then, keep going, then all this stuff is hidden, and now he's on an airplane. He's heading to Chicago with no cut on his finger, seen by a bunch of people, relaxed, talking to the pilot, on a red eye, uh, gets to Chicago, and... Oh, wait a minute. Everybody thinks he's got stuff hidden in his golf bag, which, by the way, never left Jim Merrill's car. So O.J. didn't have it. Uh, and then you hear the story about, oh, he was seen burying something in the woods across the street from the hotel. So I was there at the time, and I counted the steps from uh, how much it would take to go from room 915, because the only way to do this would be go down the stairwell, because if you went down the elevator, you're coming right out in front of a bunch of witnesses and on film. So you'd have to go down there. Then you'd have to go out the door, which, by the way, I realized when I did all that, it locked behind you. So Simpson would have to 
have the presence of mind to say, well, let me stop this door in case it locks behind me. Because in order to find out if it locks behind you, you do it like I did. You go outside, the door shuts, and then you go back in. You go, oh, fuck, I can't get in. So <laughs> Simpson would have to then uh, have the presence of mind to do all that and whatever. And then finally, forget that theory, because I then found the engineer, and that's the days when the car, credit card thing started to be used instead of keys to a room, right? So the credit card, and not the, it's not a credit card, but it's like a, a yeah, 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 card. Yeah, yeah, Electronic key. card. Not, oh, yeah, not only does it let you in your room, the little computer in the door um, registers w- when it was used, at what time you went in and what time you came out. And if you went back and forth and back and forth, it would all be on this thing, which I sent to Shapiro day one. Uh, and, uh, and the, and the cops never did that. Why didn't they go do that? If you think he went outside, just grab grab the records from the door because th- those were implemented because you could, could say, hey, somebody stole a million bucks out of my room when I was gone, you know, and then they can check and see what maid used it, when the cleanup, so they can it, – it's really to prevent fraud. So mm-hmm. uh, why didn't they go through that? I mean, I went through all that and said, well, the guy never left his room. He basically – and I got the phone records to show they get the call from LAPD – and who he calls after that. So, I mean, it just as an Well, and, and where are the shoes? I mean, presumably, I guess they're buried with the knife, maybe in Chicago yeah. or, or maybe as everyone wants to believe now, oh, they're, they're, they're you know, they're buried uh, somewhere on his property, uh, you know, yeah. with this, this stupid really? story about a yeah. knife being found and somehow that means that that was the murder weapon. Yeah. Um, Sure. You know, again, coming from some guy years later who's, oh, yeah, right. I, I forgot that when we were doing construction, I found this knife and uh, I'm only coming sure. forward now with it. But, yeah, I mean, again, yeah. this is the, 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 the shoes as an argument just falls down on, on the face of it. And again, too, I don't, I'm not like trying to, you know, attack people that, that point to the shoes. I think for the most part, people yeah. don't even really know the, the, the right. reality of what was presented with the shoes. They just hear well, but, Bruno Mali's shoes, picture of O.J., yeah. he did it. Yeah, exactly. And they don't uh, uh, critically look at all the evidence about the shoes, because if you do that, you don't just leap to the conclusion, he did it. You go, well, look at all this. Here's all the, why couldn't the FBI find these shoes, right? I mean, it's their most mm-hmm. exhaustive uh, thing. You know what some else has been gnawing at me, and I just... Uh, was bitching about this to someone recently. I said, Lee Bailey, I was talking to him. I said, Lee, they, they're saying the sock could, I mean, the glove couldn't have been planted. But how about this idea? How about on June 13th, you don't put those gloves in there to be tested for DNA? Because if Simpson's wearing these gloves, he's got skin cells and everything else on the inside of these gloves, okay, that don't fit. So why is the glove never tested for DNA? Forget the freaking pictures of shoes and and all this other stuff on the gate and all that. How about the goddamn gloves that you think Simpson was wearing to murder two people? You don't think there'd be some Simpson DNA on the inside of the, those gloves? Instead of bringing in clerks and say, oh, the bar, these are rare gloves. Everything was mm. rare in OJ. So now I'm watching this show, that Dr. Oz bullshit the other day, and Darden's on there. So mm. they're asking, and there's Dr. Oz, he just can't, you know. Uh, help himself. So he said, oh, so the gloves, you know, he had the gloves on in, in he had uh, plastic gloves underneath. Of course, they don't fit. Then he offers up, of course, everybody knows that they would have shrunk. Anybody that lives in, you live in cold weather. I mean, you probably got gloves you've had over a number of years. You wash the snow off your windshield. They don't, they don't shrink. They actually get bigger sometimes, but they don't mm-hmm. just shrink to beyond you ever wearing them again. And, and, uh, so Darden, he's going through all that. Then he goes through all that bullshit about he wasn't taking his medication. So, in other words, so OJ says, well, I'm going to stop taking my medication so my hands swell up in case this dumb yeah, fuck yeah, yeah. asks me to put the gloves on. They won't fit, right? And so, and Darden, so he says, yeah, he had the gloves and he didn't take his medication. Plus, there was cloth on the inside missing because we had tested it for DNA. First time I ever heard that. And I called Lee right away. I said, Darden's just on national TV, Dr. Oz, saying that the gloves were tested for DNA. Well, if they did, we never heard about it. And if they did test them, what's the result? Because if they would have had OJ, that would have case closed. Forget the freaking shoes and everything. You got these two gloves. If if Simpson's DNA is inside of them, you don't need weapons. You don't need anything. You know? So 
Otherwise, you'd have to argue, well, he had those gloves in the house and, like, the knit caps that got right. brought up by the dog or some crazy stuff like that. But just think about that. Chris Darden, within the last week, says on Dr. Oz that those gloves were tested for DNA on the inside. That's another reason he had a hard time because the, the cloth liner inside was all cut out to be sent for testing. Mm. So if they tested it, it came back exculpatory, and they didn't tell her. Okay? So... And now I understand the LAPD got rid of their whole damn files and all that stuff. I don't know if that's true or not, but how about that? DNA, mm. why don't you oh, and, right and Pat, I guarantee you, the uh, Darden says that on Dr. Oz, that will be repeated subsequently now. And it will be, uh-huh. it will be worded in such a way in newspapers yep. to mean we tested it, his, you know, his DNA was in there, you know? That, yeah. that'll, that'll be sort of the line. Not, we tested it for the, and this is the first time I've ever mentioning it. Uh, and, yeah. you know, and, and, and as far as yeah. you know, I mean, if they did right. test it, they never told anybody or they didn't find anything because why wouldn't they use it in that, the trial? But instead it yeah. will be, you know, it, it'll be this, become this warped quote. Oh, we tested it and, you know, and, and yeah. that means that his DNA was in it because, you know, why would we, yeah. you know what I mean? That, that's, that's yeah. the, the impression that people will get. Well, there's not a single document that we ever received in discovery, and I got a living room or dining room full of boxes to prove it that ever showed a test of the glove for DNA. And I can't believe it. Just recently, I started thinking about that, and uh, you know, I was thinking because I didn't do a whole lot. I don't worry about the science; that wasn't my gig. I used to go get all the discovery and bring it back and start reading the front page and then turn it over to Newfound and go, oh, you guys got to cross-examine this guy tomorrow with all this, <laughs> go through this stuff. And those guys are brilliant with the science. But none of us ever caught because that would have been something in a closing argument that we should have done. Like, why didn't they test these gloves? You know, But we already knew they didn't fit. We're already knowing that they're not going to fit them. We put our hands on the glass to shake hands with OJ and see how big his mitts are all these years. So we know that these things ain't going to fit. They didn't fit me, for God's sake. So we were all sitting around the table and uh, giving Darden a hard time while that uh, goofball Richard Rubin from Bloomingdale's is getting ready to testify. And, uh, you know, we should have said that in closing argument. Uh, of all the, the knit caps, give me a break, all this stuff. But how about those gloves? Do you think O.J. Simpson has finagled, make it look like the gloves don't fit him because of, they shrank some blood. Oh, and we did a whole blood experiment, by the way, uh, which is in Lee's, one of one of the Lee's books where I wrote this memo. We took blood out of my arm and put it on both gloves, and one we put in a plastic bag, and the other one we left outside under the air conditioner. It was one year later to try to stimulate something. But we, we missed it the whole time. Like, now I'm thinking, you know, forget these seats for Bruno Mowers. How about they didn't test the goddamn gloves? Where's the mm. DNA from the gloves? You could go there right now and probably take DNA tests out of it. Yeah, well, and and you know, you it'd be it'd be interesting to see you know if you tested those gloves and there's EDTA on them or something like that. Yeah, you know, I mean, right. I can only imagine why uh, you know this is speculation, but you know, the, I'm sure yeah. the prosecution was cagey, uh, especially after the the socks and the back gate. You know, oh, God, you know, we we can't have them testing everything. God only knows what they're going to find, you know, and especially if it's on the gloves, you know, and again, this there's this idea that perhaps Furman took one of the gloves and rubbed it inside the Bronco at some point, Uh, you know, so there might have been some sort of transfer or EDTA could have been, you know, something, Um, you know, that they don't want to open that up. No, no. And. We always say the same thing. It's the absence of evidence, not the presence of it, that, that shows you he couldn't have done this. I mean, I don't know if I said this on your show before or not, but I recently I have uh, I have all these skin cancer issues, so I was having what they call Mohs surgery on my chest. And the doctor that was doing it, he said, oh, I see in the papers all the time, blah, 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 blah. We're shooting the breeze. And uh, he was going on about how he thought C.C. Anthony was innocent. That sounded like a bullshit case to him. Blah, blah, blah. He said, but you know what? I know a lot about blood. And um, that's the end. Of, that's O.J. Simpson. That case, you know, that's the blood, blah, 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 blah. And I said to him, well, it's the absence, not the presence of it, because 
and his, as his assistant was dabbing, first of all, they're whatever, he's lasering my skin so it doesn't bleed like crazy, but the mm. blood, they're dipping, they're getting gauze, and she's dropping it in a, in a I'm talking about a, maybe a, I don't know, six inch incision on my chest in a very controlled environment. And so he's going on, and I said, Doc, there's more of my blood, there's more blood in that can from my, this little cut than there was in all of Simpson's case. So, if he yeah, did yeah. all this, wouldn't you think there'd be blood somewhere? And he, like, stopped in the middle of my Mo's surgery. He says, yeah, you got a good point there. <laughs> no, I, I said, well, I, and, and, and that's something, Pat, you and I have, have discussed before, too, is, I mean, the, the sure. reality of these things, you know, when, when people are actually confronted with something like, you know, you're saying, like, a you know, small surgical-type thing like this, look at the amount of blood yeah. versus what's actually found. The same thing with the, you know, uh, spend, you know, uh, go through the, the, the reenactment, of, you know, can you kill someone in 20 minutes and run over and clean yeah. the blood and move your shoes and do yeah. all these things? Or, you know, like, like I said, you know, it's the reality of these things. People are always, uh, when confronted with them, like the Bruno Molly shoes. You know, again, look yeah. at that picture and yeah. tell me honestly – you know, hand on the Bible, those are the shoes yeah. that he, you yeah. know, and, and right. in which case, and where are they? Uh, you know, yeah. how come they were never found? There's all these other things. Right. But, right. you know, it's the reality of, uh, of crime. And I think that's in part, you know, because we, we're, we're, we are obsessed with crime in America and, and crime yeah. dramas and reenactments. And we, you know, we, we yeah. do kind of lose sight of the fact that, you know, um, Murders are not like an episode of Law and Order. Murders are not even like a long form documentary series that you might see on Netflix or ESPN. Right. Um, that's that's right. not really how murders work. Uh, and I know. The, I know. I mean, and I'm sure you need just like hitting your head at the wall with this. But I think until people really kind of, uh, you know, we just. I don't know if you. I'm sure you've seen the commercials, but there's a Law and Order is doing the the Menendez brothers. Um, uh, oh, they're doing yeah, some sort of documentary on that with Edie Falco, and and I, I know yeah. almost nothing about that case, but I guarantee you, yeah. you know, you're not going to learn what really transpired no. from watching right. Law and Order. No, you're going to get whatever these producers, these Hollywood guys, the most drama they can get to pop this show for the most ratings, because like I said, they realized what a cash cow OJ is. So now they're moving into they're going to do a Casey thing and. A, Menendez thing and all these other things. Oh, I'm sure, yeah. Things. You know, more you know, John Bonet. Different. I mean, everything. Yeah. John Bonet, Scott Rant, uh, Scott, what's the guy's name out there with the wife? Scott Peterson, they'll do one mm -hmm. of those probably. Uh, just whatever's like really sensational. Uh, because that makes money. You can't do a carjacking with two people getting killed. What's that? Who cares about that? No one watches that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know? Right? No, no, I know. No, yeah, yeah. Because those crimes, yeah, they're not fun. They're they're not exciting. You right. know, they don't have celebrities yeah. or sex or sure. you know, there, there's sure. no sort of a you know um, taboo no subjects or something like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. But again, you know, I think if yeah. more people did shows on you know carjackings and and those sort, of, you know, they might actually figure out. Oh, damn, it's not like law. You know, we don't we can't wrap up a murder in an hour. Yeah. Um, yeah. Why we might want to on TV and and nothing right. really. You know, again, the the, the those sorts of um, it, it, bringing in your own sort of logic and reality to these situations is super important. You know, not just OJ, but any any yeah. large high profile crime case. Um, right, Pat, we're we're coming up uh, just on the the end of the uh, the show today. Um, and I, oh, I know okay. you, you've mentioned now a couple times that you and uh, Ethley Bailey are working on a book. Is there anything you can tell the listeners about that? Um, just the same thing that we've talked about everywhere we can go and get interviewed about how the timeline and the demeanor. And then we add new things like uh, that Brian would help on, for example, like Goldman's timeline, which will show he could not have possibly been there at, uh, at 10, 15. And then I just was, Brian sent me Lang's book. I never read Tom's book all the way through, but you know, he's at least he fought Van Atta all the way through on the timeline. So Tom Lang says, no, I think it's more like 10, 35, which is what everybody says. So, Well, excellent. Uh, Pat, we're definitely, uh, when that book comes out, we're going to have to get you on the show. I'd, of course, love oh, to talk to you sure. again very soon. Thank you for your time. Thank okay. you for doing two hours pleasure. again. Uh, it's always a pleasure to talk with you, Pat. I will be coming to Thank you sir. next week with uh, Keelan Balderson. We're going to be talking about the Manchester bombing and some of the updates. But until then, I will be talking to you very soon.
rules, no rules, no taboo topics, no taboo topics, no fear of doom, no fear of doom. We are, we are American Freedom Radio, American Freedom Radio. Since the beginning, civilizations have risen and fallen. Rome, ancient Persia, Mongolia, Britain, and now America. The fallen by natural disasters, broken families, moral decay, lack of preparedness and conflict. Don't let this happen to you. Are you prepared? Would you like to help others prepare? AmericanSurvivalWholesale.com is looking for distributors. Email BugOutAmerica at USA.com. Go to AmericanSurvivalWholesale.com, a veteran-owned and operated company. But do it today. This is Rick Simpson, and you're listening to American Freedom Radio. And I hope people support American Freedom Radio. And I hope people vote with their dollars and really understand the value of having American Freedom Radio. Because that's my family. If you love me at all, Jack Blood, support American Freedom Radio. Like my family has literally disowned me. <laughs> American Freedom Radio, Danny and Don and those guys, those are my actual family. So please, please support these guys because they have all the technology. They have all these great things that they're going to do. But obviously, they can't do it all by themselves. So not only would I like to see you support them, I'd like to see you retweet them and repost them and really get involved and get on the, the bandwagon, so to speak, on doing that do-it-yourself promotion because they're a do-it-yourself radio network and, uh, and we just need that so much. You're listening to AmericanFreedomRadio.com, the network who perseveres in delivering intelligent debate, constructive dialogue with true independence. The freedom to broadcast the truth is not free at all. So what is American Freedom Radio worth to you? The empowering information with fun, honest and pure integrity behind it provides an example to follow. Friendships to flourish with the moral altruism that pulls no punches. The hosts sacrifice and show remarkable discipline in their duty to deliver quality radio and service to the community with strength, wisdom and loyalty. The founders of AFR wish to thank you personally for sharing your views and insights to make the best radio and alternative media. Now it's time for you to give something back and play a vital role in the future of America. Be as generous with us as we've been with you. Click on the donate banner at AmericanFreedomRadio.com or volunteer by emailing AmericanFreedomRadio at Ymail.com. Vaccine, psychotropic drugs and artillery batteries not included. Prepare your mind to experience American Freedom Radio. 